Thank you for joining us this morning. Our first speaker is Dr. Gabe Talent. Dr. Talent is a board certified neurologist and sleep medicine specialist. He obtained his undergraduate degree from Barry College and attended medical school at Mercer University. He trained in neurology at the University of Florida before his fellowship training at the Mayo Clinic in Rochester, Minnesota. He has been in private practice in Chattanooga for 12 years. To help me welcome Dr. Talent as he presents Sleep Apnea, Cardiac and Cerebral Vascular Disease. there. Good morning. Can everyone hear me? Oops. Let's see. Good morning. Oh. All right. Very good. Uh, so, um, just want to make sure that everyone can, uh, see the screen here with the slide presentation. Is that correct? All right. Okay, so we'll go ahead and get started. Uh, I wanted to talk with you this morning about sleep apnea and cardiac and cerebrovascular implications and impact. Um, and I think we'll have a few minutes toward the end for some uh, questions. Uh, this is a, a sort of a statistical type uh, presentation, so there are a lot of numbers, so I apologize for that, but uh, don't worry about remembering them. You can always refer back to this. Uh, I have no associations or affiliations with industry to disclose. We'll go quickly through the first few slides because much of this is uh, already what most of you know. Uh, with... Um, Obstructive sleep apnea, of course, we all know it's the repetitive upper airway obstructions leading to desaturations and Dr. Uh, support. Dr. Talent, uh, this, yes, is, this is Candy. Um, we can't see any of your slides. We're just seeing uh, a black screen. Okay, I clicked share. Um, let me see what I might have uh, not clicked here. I clicked share screen. Um, there we go. I, I redid that. Okay, so sorry. Thank you. Oh, Thank you for right. letting me know. Sure. Mm -hmm. um, and now everyone can see the slides? I believe they can. Okay. All right. So very good. And just in terms of uh, sleep apnea, of course, uh, the impact, we're, we're really still discovering just how uh, prominent that is. It's estimated that about 54 million people have obstructive sleep apnea, 37% uh, of the U.S. adult population, and 18% has moderate to severe obstructive sleep apnea. Dr. Talbot, course, let, me, let me interrupt you again. Um, what should we see on your slides right now? There is, uh, it says obstructive sleep apnea and it uh, goes over some of the statistics. All we're seeing is Encore Health Care logo. Okay, let me. Um, I thought we had it and. Um, okay, uh, let's see here. Let me see if I can, uh, I'm not sure how to, change let's see maybe if i click new share um let's see if this oh, does that there we go i think we've got oh, it now okay excellent i'm so sorry i clicked share <laughs> screen but uh, apparently it shared the the other screen so okay perfect we're well, good to go sorry right about before. that all right excellent so uh i was just saying and, and of course as we know um Increasing weight uh, definitely uh, increases the incidence of sleep apnea. So, you know, even 41% of individuals of uh, a BMI of near obesity or higher um, is uh, 
uh, uh, actually um, is, is sleep apnea present in, in that circumstance. And an estimated 85% or more are undiagnosed. Um, we know the predisposing factors, no need to go through that. The classic signs and symptoms, that can just be there for your, your reference later so we can get to the meat of the, uh, of the talk. And of course, sleep apnea and, and severity levels um, and potential consequences. And in particular on this uh, talk, we're gonna focus on uh, the cardiac disease and, and, and stroke elements. Um, central sleep apnea also has a substantial effect potentially uh, in these circumstances uh, very commonly. Of course, that's a temporary loss of uh, ventilatory effort in the absence of any obstruction. And basically what you're getting in this situation is a, a, a hypersensitive uh, chemoreflex uh, ventilatory increased loop gain situation, basically where you cause this overshoot and undershoot uh, with the oscillation of the ventilation. Uh, the particular risk factors for this condition are males over age 60 uh, with a history of either atrial fibrillation, stroke, some stroke, not all stroke, uh, congestive heart failure, especially those with very low ejection fractions, treatment with opioid medications, and also daytime hypocapnia. And one thing that can differentiate central sleep apnea from obstructive sleep apnea in terms of patient populations, uh, oftentimes central sleep uh, apnea patients will have very few, if any, uh, signs or symptoms outwardly in terms of what they will complain of. Uh, so very different presentation oftentimes, and uh, honestly much easier to miss in terms of detecting it in the first place. Um, this you can refer to later, it's just talking about the different types of central sleep apnea, you know, uh, the situation, sometimes it's induced by treatment with positive airway pressure, and of course, uh, chain stokes respiratory pattern. The oximetry in central sleep apnea uh, looks very different, even though this looks very highly oscillatory. If you look in central sleep apnea, it's almost as though you can draw these black boxes uh, inside uh, the SpO2 tracing. And so uh, whenever you see that, and here where it goes off the top, basically, uh, during those periods of hyperpnea, um, that is a telltale sign, and, and honestly, it's very easy to, to detect that and predict that based on the oximetry appearance versus just more of the oscillatory pattern you see in obstructive sleep apnea. Uh, Everyone Dr. Knows? Dr. Um, Talent, where, yes. your slides aren't changing. Um, Are okay. you like, the one we see right now is obstructive sleep apnea? Uh, this, okay, I'm not sure. I've, I'm advancing it on my computer. Mm. Um, let's see. Let me check. I'm going to try and see here. Um, what we're seeing now is a new slide that says cardiac disease. Oh, okay. I think we're on a delay then. Uh, I think that must be what it is because that's the slide where I am. Um, okay, if- uh, Their analysis, if apnea physiologic effects. Okay, so you can say, okay, well, um, okay. it seems must as though there's a little bit of a delay. I didn't change anything there, so. Okay, well. Uh, just let me know if it's that. not keeping up. Yeah. Okay, I'll do I'll do that. I hate to keep interrupting you. Oh no, thank you. I appreciate that because there's no way for me to know otherwise. Thank you. All right, thanks. Um, so during an apnea, what effects do you see? So actually, during the event itself, uh, you commonly get uh, get bradycardia with an AV block, increased systemic vascular resistance, and your cardiac output, which is basically your stroke volume times your heart rate that decreases by as much as one third. That's actually during the apnea itself. Your blood pressure during the apnea undergoes several changes. Usually it's decreased early. Uh, it increases late during the apnea and then also in the post apnea period. And that's what predominates. And because of the adrenergic releases that you get from the apneas, 
that you can see that effect last during uh, the daytime the next day. Usually after the events, you get an increase in heart rate and your cardiac output increases by 10 to 15%. So you can see just drastic changes there uh, associated with the actual event, uh, both during and afterward. You get you get decreased fibrinolysis and increased fibrinogen and platelet aggregation. So the net result of all those is basically pro-clotting. So you can imagine how obviously that will impact uh, cardiovascular and cerebrovascular disease. Um, let's turn our attention to congestive heart failure for a moment. Does everyone, did the screen advance there? Yes, sir, it did. Thank you. Okay, very good. Just wanted to make sure. Um, so uh, with congestive heart failure, uh, you can get progression of this condition with both obstructive sleep apnea and central sleep apnea. Uh, part of the cause of that is you get a lot of rostral fluid shifts in CHF. Uh, so that rostral fluid shift to the neck obviously can help lead to more obstructive sleep apnea. And those fluid shifts to the alveoli can help contribute to central sleep apnea. Um, and also, of course, the reverse is true. Obstructive sleep apnea tends to worsen CHF. Uh, you get, uh, in this situation, decreased preload going into the heart, a leftward shift of the cardiac septum, increased afterload, and a net decreased cardiac output. Uh, so as you can imagine, all those uh, uh, each of those uh, characteristics there will help worsen congestive heart failure and the pump action of the heart. Severe uh, obstructive sleep apnea is a very powerful predictor of two-year mortality. Now, uh, and think about that. That's just two years in congestive heart failure. So all the more important that you really be aggressive about uh, identifying that and treating that if that is the case, and they do indeed have uh, congestive heart failure. Apnea is associated with uh, post-discharge mortality and readmission in the setting of acute CHF as well. So not just in the long run, but also in the short run, in the months thereafter, uh, any hospital discharge uh, for, for an uh, issue with CHF exacerbation. CHF patients are, are frequently uh, hypocapnic, and that helps trigger apneic events, uh, again, oscillating just above and below that uh, respiratory threshold for triggering breathing events, uh, excuse me, regular breaths. Um, 40 to 50% of heart failure patients have central sleep apnea, incredibly common. So that's why whenever you see CHF in the history, you definitely wanna pay close attention for uh, central events uh, when looking at someone's study. Um, the reasons why uh, CSA can be so frequent in CHF, you get increased pulmonary congestion, uh, prolonged circulation time, and they also have that increased chemosensitivity that tends to lead to that uh, increased loop gain, which uh, uh, causes you to basically overshoot and undershoot uh, in terms of respirations and leads to that uh, periodicity of breathing. Uh, CSR, so chain stokes respirations, uh, is present in 30 to 40% of CHF patients. Uh, these individuals often have uh, longer apnea, hypertonia cycles um, of a minute or more, uh, especially with prolonged circulation time situations. So, and that's certainly something that you get with congestive heart failure uh, patients without question. There was a randomized control trial showing uh, CPAP's impact on survival in CHF patients. So we know that it's bad. So what effect does our treatment have on that? And that clearly showed uh, increased survival. Uh, several years ago, I'm sure you're all familiar with the, uh, the CERV HF heart failure uh, study. It was a large study in of uh, 1,300 
uh, patients with CHF and predominantly central sleep apnea were randomized either to medical management or uh, ASV. And they stopped the study early because ASV appeared to have no particular uh, impact on all-cause mortality, uh, admission, or hospitalization for uh, those heart failure patients. But it did have a negative impact in terms of cardiovascular specific mortality. So that was kind of what's uh, caused the change uh, uh, several years ago, probably five, six years ago now, um, where we uh, realized that ASV, uh, adapt servo ventilation or auto servo ventilation is contraindicated really, uh, in particular for individuals with uh, ejection fractions of 45% or, or less. There is another <clears throat> possible therapy in the long run uh, that's currently being uh, looked at and developed um, and investigated, and that is transvenous phrenic nerve stimulation. So basically like a pacemaker for the phrenic nerve in order to help uh, even out respirations and cause uh, individuals to uh, have uh, more of a normalization of their uh, respirations, okay? All right, so uh, let's look at uh, atrial fibrillation. As everyone knows, uh, atrial fibrillation is, um, let me see, let me, uh, I think it advanced one screen too many. There we go. Uh, it's quite prevalent in uh, uh, individuals with, uh, excuse me, sleep apnea is quite prevalent in individuals with atrial fibrillation in as much as 50%. And that, and you'll notice that in the clinic, it's very common uh, when you're uh, evaluating patients with a history of uh, atrial fibrillation that are referred over by cardiology um, because they're so concerned about that being one of the main factors that keeps throwing people back into AFib. Uh, very, more, far more often than not, you detect it. So, you know, maybe present in 50%, but of those individuals getting referred, it feels like it's closer to 80 or 90%. Um, uh, this is projected to affect as many as 10 million people by 2050. So, obviously, it's only going to get to be more common. And some of the mechanisms by which sleep apnea are increasing in inflammation, uh, intrathoracic pressures, and CO2 levels. Uh, also, you get uh, increased fibrosis uh, within the heart, and that leads to both structural and electrical remodeling. So um, you can get interference uh, with that normal electrical conduction through the heart and that tends to lead to more atrial fibrillation. Um, years ago in the sleep heart health study, there was a strong association between uh, sleep apnea and both atrial and ventricular arrhythmias. Uh, there was a two to five uh, fold increase of atrial fibrillation if someone had severe obstructive sleep apnea and a two to threefold uh, uh, odds of atrial fibrillation if the individual had central sleep apnea. All right, so uh, with uh, atrial fibrillation, it definitely seems to be associated with the increasing degree of hypoxia. So in other words, you know, of course, the, the, the lower that SpO2 nadir gets and stays and, and, and frequently dips too, along with the sleep apnea severity, um, uh, those definitely are uh, correlated with prevalence of atrial fibrillation. So uh, as, with, as with much that is correlated with sleep apnea, the, the worse it is uh, for the apnea, the worse it is for the, the other associated condition. Uh, a few years ago, there was a case crossover study that showed within 
a minute and a half of an episode of apnea or hypopnea, there was an 18-fold increased risk of uh, an arrhythmia during the night, uh, in particular atrial fibrillation or non-sustained VTAC. So it's very clear that uh, it's not just a matter of wear and tear over time, but also definitely uh, the milieu that's taking place at the time of the event definitely uh, helps induce uh, those atrial fib episodes or uh, SVT episodes. Um, CPAP treatment definitely can help uh, in these situations. Um, very commonly in the clinic, we'll see people referred for uh, atrial fibrillation where they've had cardioversion, they've uh, maybe had ablation, and uh, they just keep having recurrent paroxysmal atrial fibrillation. We'll do the studies, uh, check for obstructive sleep apnea, detect that, treat it, and then all of a sudden there's a drastic change in terms of uh, the amount of AFib recurrence. Um, so uh, CPAP usage, uh, after that's been prescribed and AF recurrence are, uh, have been shown to be inversely correlated. So in other words, uh, the more you use your device, the less likely you are to have recurrence. And in particular, with CPAP treatment, patients with uh, atrial fibrillation, uh, paroxysmal atrial fibrillation, have a 42% relative risk reduction in recurrence of that AFib. And that's regardless of their uh, primary treatment. So regardless as to which uh, medications they're on, for example, or procedures they've undergone, um, uh, including uh, cardioversion. So you know, anytime you can get a 42% a relative risk reduction with any condition, that is really drastic. So quite pronounced, okay? Um, definitely worthwhile. That's why the cardiologists are so uh, attuned to this and uh, are, are so likely to refer for evaluation for uh, obstructive sleep apnea and treatment. All right, let's talk about uh, sleep apnea and cardiovascular disease. Um, and at the, at the end, we'll try and go back and uh, I'll show you some of those slides that you may have missed uh, at the start of the talk when uh, the, the screen sharing did not seem to be uh, going through. So we'll make sure you don't miss any of those. And you can see some of what I was referring to, too, in terms of the oximetry tracings. All right. So... Uh, how prevalent is uh, obstructive sleep apnea in individuals with cardiovascular disease? So in other words, coronary artery disease, uh, MI. In particular, with acute MI situations, sleep apnea and sleep disorder breathing in general is found in up to 60%. So again, you know, if, if you remember back on the previous slide and then you see this down here, um, uh, with sleep apnea and heart attacks, the vast majority of those occur during those early morning hours. And you know, uh, there's no question because of all those uh, basically pro-clotting effects of that, uh, clearly there is um, uh, a physiologic reason for that, uh, and that's the correlation. With uh, sleep apnea, uh, if that's present, you get a two to three fold increase in uh, the cardiovascular outcomes and all cause mortality in the situations of uh, acute MI. So definitely, if you have that, you want to treat that and soon uh, because it is uh, imminently dangerous as well as over the long run. In 2005, uh, there was a large study, uh, an N of 1,500, uh, that uh, had a duration of 10 years, so quite uh, 
quite a prolonged follow-up period there. And that showed that treatment of obstructive sleep apnea uh, patients uh, in the setting of a history of cardiovascular disease, if you treated that sleep apnea, they had survival approaching that of non-obstructive sleep apnea patients. So uh, definitely just goes to show that the treatment uh, if adhered to can, can definitely have a huge uh, impact, okay? And in particular, patients with obstructive sleep apnea, there's a higher risk of so sudden nocturnal cardiac death Again, especially during those early morning hours, 12 midnight uh, to 6 a.m., when both uh, cardiac and cerebrovascular uh, events are at their peak uh, during, the, during the day. Sleep apnea that's moderate to severe uh, is uh, even more associated with worse outcomes after uh, heart attack, uh, you get less myocardial salvage. In other words, um, basically uh, uh, heart tissue, cardiac tissue itself, uh, where it improves after the event, uh, and you get less reduction of the actual infarct size. Uh, so clearly far less recovery, and also less recovery of their ejection fraction if uh, that is affected by the, the uh, severity of the heart attack. Um, there's, uh, there's one thing that's debated, and I threw this on here kind of as food for thought. Um, th this is certainly not a settled issue, but one thing that's, uh, that, that people have posed is the question of poor outcomes in the setting of acute myocardial infarction versus is there anything uh, regarding increased collateral development and ischemic preconditioning from those periods of intermittent hypoxia that you get uh, with apneic episodes? Um, at present, my opinion is that even though, yes, you may get some degree of intermittent hypoxia uh, leading to increased collateral development, I don't think that's uh, to the degree that it um, is in any way, of course, advantageous. advantageous. And we know that based on the numbers that we've seen uh, just in terms of outcomes and uh, correlation between uh, sleep apnea and severity and uh, cardiovascular disease versus any benefit you might get. Sometimes you can get, um, like, uh, I don't think it, it uh, is exactly like the situation where you get with an individual, for example, with carotid disease, uh, stenosis of the carotid artery, where if that's a slow process and over a considerable amount of time, then people do tend to develop extensive collateralization. Some people do uh, around that. And uh, so then even if the carotid becomes occluded, they still get sufficient blood flow so as to not infarct uh, the area of the brain supplied by the carotid artery. Um, and, uh, but anyway, that certainly bears a great deal more investigation and uh, uh, certainly an interesting thing to think about. All right. So now we'll talk about uh, the other part of the um, presentation. So the cerebrovascular. So we've looked at various conditions associated with cardiac diseases and sleep apnea. So let's, uh, let's talk for a minute about uh, cerebrovascular disease. So sleep and stroke. Um, stroke um, incidence uh, definitely peaks in the early morning hours to around midday. Um, so especially toward the end of nighttime sleep. It's least common in the late evening to midnight time frame. Um, overall, your blood pressure is lower at night by about 10 to 20 percent. Um, so certainly that can help uh, predispose. So you're already uh, getting less uh, cerebral blood flow uh, during your nighttime sleep as compared to the daytime. Um, Obstructive sleep apnea 
and snoring are both independent risk factors for stroke. So, you know, this is always uh, interesting. And, and snoring, I, I should mention, you know, is increased uh, increases the risk for uh, cardiovascular disease as well. So it always makes you wonder why, you know, with uh, attempting to get um, approval for uh, coverage for devices and things like that, why significant snoring alone is not enough just because we know this, you know, it's, it's in and of itself, snoring is a risk factor for these diseases. So uh, who knows, maybe down the road we'll, uh, uh, address that, and that will no longer be as much of an issue in terms of an uphill battle to get coverage. But uh, you definitely get decreased fibrinolysis in the morning hours. That's just normally. That's that's normal physiology. You have less of that, and so obviously that helps predispose uh, along with the increased platelet aggregation, uh, like we talked about. So, and you think about it. So you're in in this kind of situation. You know, you have decreased blood pressure. Uh, decreased anticoagulation factors present in the blood normally. And then um, what else has taken place during this time? Uh, you're getting more of your stage REM sleep, which of course for many, many individuals is when uh, they tend to have uh, worse uh, obstructive sleep apnea. Um, and uh, so, you know, it's kind of interesting certainly that uh, all of that has taken place at the same time. Sleep apnea is a strong risk factor uh, for stroke, along with many of the other just typical vascular uh, risk factors, hypertension, cholesterol, uh, diabetes. Um, males, uh, there's a, a considerably higher incidence of uh, stroke in males, 24 to 30% higher incidence. Um, uh, age greater than 55 in particular, and uh, many of uh, the minority races um, uh, have an increased uh, risk for stroke. Um, and uh, so that's for your reference for later. So how common is it? Uh, it's, it's definitely quite common in ischemic stroke uh, patients. Um, and this is uh, in all uh, distributions of stroke and vessel diameter. So in other words, um, sleep apnea doesn't just increase your risk for one type of stroke, <clears throat> but you can see that brain stem, cerebrum, it can be large vessel, small vessel, all of those situations. And there was one study <clears throat> that looked at the incidence and found that an apnea hypopnea index of 10 or higher was found in 60% of the individuals with stroke versus 20% of the control group. <laughs> Excuse me. So absolutely shows that um, those are uh, correlated. Um, snoring and obstructive sleep apnea are also associated with systemic hypertension. So uh, I just throw that in there to illustrate that it's not just a one-to-one. -one. Many of these, you know, affect many other situations that help further increase stroke risk. Uh, and for that matter, cardiovascular risk as well. Individuals with sleep apnea have a higher mortality after stroke. Um, and, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, I'm sorry, I've got to get a quick drink of water. Sorry about that. Um, <clears throat> and what you get is with, with those breathing events, all those repetitive adrenergic releases, uh, where you get the norepinephrine, uh, prominently circulating throughout the system, you get a lot of vessel constriction and damage uh, uh, to that intima, or the, uh, especially the inner layers of the blood vessels, causing thicker vessel walls, which of course further narrows uh, the lumens of those vessels and predisposes to uh, things like stroke and heart attack. Um, okay. So, um, you get a lot of hemodynamic changes 
uh, where it compounds uh, the situation where in the early morning hours uh, you get that predisposed situation to having more pro-coagulation or, or clotting. And uh, the presence of sleep apnea compounds that uh, can help uh, lead to decreased fibrinolysis, reduced cerebral perfusion, and poor autoregulation where uh, the blood vessels themselves uh, adjust and adapt uh, to help control blood flow uh, to different parts of the brain. Um, the intermittent hypoxia with sleep apnea uh, causes a lot of uh, inflammation, that endothelial damage, prothrombotic effects, and vasoconstriction itself. Um, again, uh, with all the uh, adrenergic releases that you get. Uh, the apneic events, uh, again, acutely lead to uh, changes, much like we saw with uh, uh, cardiac effects. <clears throat> uh, the apnea events themselves lead to an approximate 15 to 20% reduction in cerebral blood flow. Uh, as sleep apnea severity increases, so does stroke risk, uh, common theme, of course, uh, that we're noticing. So just reinforces what we commonly say in clinic, you know, that you know, the worse it is, the more risk it poses, obviously. And it's not to say that um, <clears throat> Uh, mild apnea uh, does not pose significant risk. Of course it does. It's just something that's on a continuum. Treatment with CPAP lowers the mean blood pressure and gives an approximate 20% risk reduction for stroke. Uh, just to put that into perspective, that's dramatic because uh, with treatment with aspirin, or other antiplatelet medications uh, that you commonly see after an individual has a stroke, that gives, uh, depending upon which agent, probably somewhere between an 18 to 21 percent risk reduction for recurrent stroke. So you can see you're talking about something that's effective, <clears throat> excuse me, as effective as the primary treatment that everyone talks about and focuses on. So uh, definitely very significant. All right, so central sleep apnea and stroke. Um, you see this in about 10 to 30% of acute stroke patients. That's due to uh, ischemic lesions affecting particular brain centers involved with respiration, um, <clears throat> which of course is kind of complex. That's probably its own separate talk no one wants to hear uh, that involves a great deal of neuroanatomy. This can improve over time, so you don't automatically, just because you see central sleep apnea uh, after stroke, uh, it doesn't necessarily mean that that's going to persist. Commonly after three months or so, uh, you see uh, considerable improvement of that uh, or even resolution frequently. But of course, this can alter uh, cerebral blood flow and um, especially if they have other medical conditions that uh, can play into both situations. And stroke can cause sleep disorders. So, um, you know, strokes themselves can lead to excessive daytime sleepiness, in particular if it affects anything involving the uh, thalamus or the reticular activating formation. Um, REM sleep behavior disorder, there are certain lesions, uh, in particular pontine type lesions, uh, that can uh, lead to RBD. And we'll talk more about that later this morning. Um, and in general, stroke can either cause uh, sleep apnea uh, de novo, or it may just exacerbate or, uh, or make worse uh, obstructive sleep apnea in that situation. Um, and of course, you can get uh, those uh, lesions leading to uh, central sleep apnea or chain stokes respirations. That's another, stroke is another possibility in terms of the etiology for chain stokes. And stroke, depending upon where it affects, of course, can alter circadian rhythms, uh, especially it involves, if it involves any uh, pathways uh, related to the hypothalamus. 
So um, in summary, with regard to stroke in particular, uh, sleep disorders can contribute to stroke and vice versa. It's a very common scenario. Treatment drastically reduces uh, the recurrent stroke situation um, frequently by as much as uh, primary treatment with antiplatelet medications, uh, your aspirins, uh, Plavix, so forth. Um, but then again, of course, always uh, prevention is uh, superior to subsequent treatment. So um, the earlier we can detect uh, not only sleep apnea, but all the other risk factors, the more you can have a uh, substantial uh, impact and benefit. So um, with that being said, these are just references. Uh, I will try and go back just real quickly here to show you um, the, because uh, I don't, I think this was some of the slides that you didn't see, the two or three there toward the start. Um, the oximetry that I was talking about in obstructive sleep apnea and central sleep apnea, with central sleep apnea, you can almost drill boxes here uh, with the oscillatory variation. And you can see where it's, it, it clearly is cut off on the top end. And that's where you get all those periods of hyperpnea. Uh, and it gives this appearance. So commonly with the symmetry, you can glance at that and uh, have a good idea. Even with obstructive sleep apnea, you know, you can see this, but it's not that same appearance where it looks like that, those boxes that you can uh, uh, draw within that oscillatory variation. So I just want to point that out because that's a good way to uh, detect something early and say, hey, I think we need to consider uh, central sleep apnea. So I've always found that uh, in particular a, a useful tool. All right, and I think, uh, do we have uh, time for a, a few questions? Yes, Dr. Uh, Talent, we do have a couple questions here. Uh, one of them is the th uh, attendee says, I have had patients that had moderate to severe OSA, but had no respiratory events in, our, in REM. Why, when we are taught OSA is worse in REM? That's, uh, that's a good point. And honestly, we don't fully know why some people have so much more REM related obstructive sleep apnea than others. Um, uh, but it, you can see a situation where uh, some people, uh, a lot of people have much worse stage REM sleep, sleep apnea, because you get that decreased muscle tone. So, you know, you can get situations where you get more obstruction because uh, really during stage REM, all of your skeletal muscle is uh, uh, in a relaxed state. So you don't get the accessory muscles of breathing. You really just got your diaphragm doing your work. But uh, there are definitely, there's that group of individuals where uh, they do not seem to have as much during stage REM and we don't fully know why that is. Presumably, um, they're, they're less affected by uh, perhaps body habitus sometimes. So uh, their, their apnea is not as reliant upon uh, the accessory muscles and things like that in terms of the contribution that they play in leading to that airway obstruction. Uh, but no, it's a good question and a, pu a puzzling one because sometimes you'll see somebody and you would really predict that they might likely be someone who would have uh, sleep apnea that's worse during stage REM, but in, indeed they don't. Um, so no question, there's there's got to be some uh, variability there in, just in terms of uh, uh, chemo receptors. Uh, you know, what's, what's picking up on those uh, SpO2 dips and things like that and what's driving that? Because uh, that is quite significant, the difference in our, our chemo reception uh, in stage room <clears throat> versus other stages. Thank you. Uh, we do have another um, comment and question here. Um, the participant says, excellent informational stats to help techs and patients alike. I have OSA and AFib, and so appreciate the breakdown. 
but uh, she is asking if she could have mm -hmm. access to the presentation slides post conference. Would there be any way you could uh, give us your email address so she, uh, any of the participants, could reach out to you individually to get um, maybe some of the information from the slides? That would be absolutely fine. I would be happy to share it. I would uh, what I would recommend, and I'm certainly fine with anyone having my email. But uh, uh, and you're welcome to it if you'd like it. Um, I'm not the best email checker in the world currently. I think I have 79,000 unchecked <laughs> messages in my inbox. So what I may do is send that to uh, maybe Colleen or someone okay. And, okay. And, and they can contact her and then uh, have the presentation if that's okay. If not, we'll figure out some other way. But yeah, I'm happy to share them. Uh, Andrea, but I, well, I get Andrea, so many emails every day. It's impossible for me to go through the hundreds. Right. <laughs> so, that would be so it would be too easily missed. Andrea, would you just put in the comments or in the chat your email address? Well, your full name and email. Well, we have your email address and what you're looking for. And we'll get back to you on that. Okay. Okay. 